record on this video. Um, so we actually have a recording that we can share with you all afterwards. So now we're doing that. Uh, but once again, my name is Carissa Sorensen. I'm the director of the Social Sciences Academic Resource Center. I'm also joined by one of our peer consultants, Alina. Alina, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Alina. I am one of the peer consultants in the uh, Social Sciences Academic Resource Center, and um, I'm a fourth year double majoring in quantitative economics and psychology. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alina. And Alina is also thinking about grad school, so we're going to be uh, picking her brain right now. Um, but you're all here because either you are probably thinking about graduate school, um, maybe curious about it, or you're kind of literally in the process of applying right now. And you're wondering, what am I getting myself into um, this fall quarter and beyond? And so that's what we're going to kind of talk about is a little bit more about the timeline ahead for you all um, as you're thinking about graduate school. If you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the Q&A. Um, and then we'll go ahead and answer some of these questions at the very end of our presentation. Um, so first things first, um, let's talk about it. Okay, so I know one of the biggest questions that we get is gap year. So I know that maybe some of you might be considering a gap year. Feel free to like say uh, in the chat if you wanna like share with us if you're considering a gap year, if this applies to you. Maybe you're still on the edge about it and you're just quite not sure about if you want to pursue a gap year. Um, and then some of you are just intending to go right into graduate school um, next fall quarter, and that's great too. Um, but I did want to spend some time talking about gap year because it is very important to kind of consider. Um, so gap year, what exactly is it? So it's a kind of known as a transition period prior to pursuing graduate school. Now I know it says gap year, so you kind of think, oh, it's only a year but um, that's not necessary. It could be a year, two years, three years, as long as you want, could be gap years. Um, so don't feel like you have to put yourself in a box and on, you know, a gap year is only um, a gap year. Um, but there's many reasons to pursue a gap year. And I know one of the questions that we got earlier in our RSVP submissions is, is a gap year bad? And the answer is absolutely not. A gap year is great, um, but you know it depends on you and your specific, specific situation if it's the right choice for you. Now, Alina, I know you're thinking about a gap year. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about why you're thinking about that or why you think it might be a good choice for you? Yeah, of course. So for me personally, I kind of considered graduate school uh, late in my third year. So currently I'm a fourth year. So it was a pretty recent decision for me to like kind of transition my original career uh, path to going into graduate school. So I know that obtaining research experience is very um, key and crucial to applying to graduate school. So um, for me, I really wanna prioritize obtaining research experience. So that's why I kind of plan to continue research, uh, continue my, uh, participation in a research lab currently for my fourth year, and then maybe take a year or two to continue either working in the lab or obtaining other volunteer experiences. And for me, I was also very like uh, skeptical and I wasn't sure if taking a gap year is good, but after talking to a lot of faculty and mentors in the psychology department, they're like, it's completely normal to take a gap year or to, to kind of gain more experience before applying and that can even give you like an upper hand. Uh, but also, uh, I got a question in the Q&A that said that the chat is disabled, so I'm not too sure how oh. to enable that. Never mind. Don't worry about the chat. We'll just need the Q and A. <laughs> Thanks, Alina. <laughs> yeah, awesome. but that, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that you pointed out was that it's completely normal, and we do want to normalize that gap years is something that many students um, end up doing, um, and it could be for various reasons. So again, for Alina, it's to get more experience, and so um, experience could mean research. It could mean an internship or a full-time position. Um, so on our presentation, you'll see that developing transferable skills through real life experiences. And so this can mean a lot of different things. Um, other reasons to explore a gap year, you know, maybe you want to fulfill a dream. Maybe that dream is to go abroad or, um, you know, do something else um, different. Also, um, 
you know, maybe self-evaluation assessments, learning more about yourself and your interests. Um, perhaps you want to volunteer or make an impact in your community. Gap years are also a really great time to study for all your entrance exams, especially if you're looking into law school. You, you know, studying for the LSAT is like a full-time job on its own. Um, maybe you're thinking about medical school or, um, a, for example, a doctorate, PhD, or just master's program in general. Um, you might be taking GRE. So um, that is a really great time to do so. And I know for a lot of students, they know that they want to go to graduate school, but they're quite uncertain about what career path they want to take. And so it's okay to kind of give yourself a little bit more time. So we just wanted to kind of share a little bit more um, about gap years. And so for those of you who are intending to um, go straight into graduate school um, right after UCI, um, we're actually going to talk a little bit more about where you should be at this point in time. So over the summer, you have, should have done um, the following things, okay? And so those things are first to determine which type of graduate degree best fits your career goals. So again, is it a master's degree? Is it a you know, MBA, for example? Is it a, a PhD? So on and so forth. So once you've identified um, those specific degrees, then you can kind of, you know, move forward and hopefully you've had um, in identifying which type of program would be best for you at what institutions. Um, another big thing is really thinking um, about your finances. You know, are you financially prepared to go to graduate school? So most master's programs are not really funded. There's not too much funding available in the first place. There might be some scholarships, um, depending on the program that you are interested in. Um, another uh, thing to keep in mind is that for PhD programs, those are often fully funded. So for example, at UCI, there's actually guaranteed five years um, of funds available in the form of stipends or fellowships um, or TAs as well. Um, so really thinking about your finances and whether you wanna pursue a loan um, or complete the FAFSA um, to, in order to get a loan or talking to your family members about what your plan is um, and so on and so forth. Um, step three, so ultimately preparing for your exams. So hopefully you've had the chance to at least prepare for your exams over the summer. Maybe you were able to take that entrance exam over the summer, which is great. You're already on track. Um, and at, at this point, you should already be registered to take your exams um, if you haven't already. Now, one thing to know is that a lot of graduate school programs are actually wavering um, these entrance exams. So you'll want to make sure to follow up with each of the programs that you're applying to and just double check is this entrance exam waived or not? And, you know, is that something that, do you still wanna do it and just still submit it or you're okay with not taking the exam? Um, and then last part, not least, is begin working on all of your statements. So hopefully you've had some time to kind of draft your personal statement or your statement of purpose or both or any of the essays that the programs um, are requiring. Um, that's something that should be in kind of the development stages right now, okay? So hopefully you have all those kind of checked mark on your list. Um, and now you can kind of fully submerge yourself in all the to do's uh, for fall quarter. Okay. Um, I do want to um, kind of point out that the Division of Career Pathways is actually putting on a law graduate and professional virtual fair on November 3rd. So if you haven't registered for this already, please do so on Handshake. It's going to be kind of an all day thing from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. I believe they are also having a STEM virtual fair this month too, if you're maybe thinking about STEM. Um, so that's another thing that you can kind of keep in mind as well. Um, so next steps that you'll be doing this fall quarter is, um, you know, going to the registers website and um, requesting transcripts um, for each of your programs. Um, and that's another thing to keep in mind that, you know, senior year is not over yet. So you wanna make sure that you continue to do your very best in your classes, being able to maintain um, all your courses as well. Um, another thing that you'll also be asking faculty for is requesting letters of recommendation. Um, this could be from professors. For some programs, they request supervisors. That's pretty common in MBA programs. Um, so 
you'll start want to identify like who are going to be your professors that you're going to be reaching out to. And I know that during this time, it's kind of a, an odd time to kind of connect with your faculty in a remote environment, but it's just going to take um, that much more initiative to do so. So typically how people reach out to faculty um, about letters of rec is ultimately through email. You can also request to meet with them via Zoom and talk more about your request as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what you should be providing to your recommenders um, very soon. Um, another thing is FAFSA as of October 1st has opened. So if you are intending to get some loans in, um, you should be applying to that right now, okay? Um, and then of course, um, you'll want to be aware of like all the various deadlines um, for all your graduate school programs. Um, some programs have rolling admission deadlines. Some programs have early admissions. Um, and so you'll wanna make sure that you identify which deadline you will be applying to. Um, you'll always want to apply at the earliest deadline as possible. So that way you have full consideration for maybe any of their scholarships um, that they might have. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and um, talk a little bit more about the graduate school portfolio. So what should you be sending to your recommenders? Um, ultimately, you want to send them a um, graduate school matrix. So AKA all list of like the programs that you actually are gonna be applying to. So any information that you can provide about these particular programs, the deadlines and so forth, um, you'll want to provide them that list. You should also include any essays that you've been drafting. So like your personal statement, statement of purpose, providing these types of statements gives them a further insight to who you are. So they might know you well as, you know, academically, but they may not know um, too much information about your background. And so that will give them more of a holistic outlook on who you are as a student and just as a person in general. You should also be including your curriculum vitae or your resume, so either one. Um, typically, whatever the graduate school program is asking for, that's what you should probably provide um, to your recommender as well. Um, at SARC, we're happy to take a look at your curriculum vitae, also known as a CV, or your resumes as well. Um, you should also give them a copy of your transcripts so that they, way, um, they can take a look at some of your grades that you have going on, um, as well as any like relevant coursework or papers. Um, that's a, other additional things that can provide them insight to your writing ability and, and who you are and hopefully jog their memory if maybe you were in one of their classes. Um, and last but not least, always thanking your recommender. Um, having a thank you email at the very end, thanking them for all their hard work because it does take a lot of time um, to write letters of recommendation, okay? All right, and then last but not least here, uh, we have our final steps and this is gonna be for winter quarter. So at around January, February, you might be um, thinking about, um, okay, is there any other programs that I should be applying to? Some programs have, uh, later deadlines, like as late as May or June. Um, so you might be still applying at that time. PhD programs, those deadlines are pretty often around December 1st. That's a pretty common deadline for PhD programs. And so really kind of outlining and just getting organized um, is hopefully something that you're currently doing right now. Um, another thing to also keep in mind is uh, connecting with all of your programs and making sure that they are receiving all the information um, that you're sending to them. Because um, it's not fun at the very end of this process where you realize that, oh, my transcripts were never received. And sometimes that can happen. Um, and technology these days, who knows? Um, so always wanna make sure that you double check and follow up with all your programs during that time. Um, and then hopefully you're getting acceptances to come in. And so you're gonna wanna compare all the various acceptances that you are getting, especially if you're applying to PhD programs, oftentimes you can compare financial aid offers. So let's say you apply to UC Berkeley, they give you a pretty good offer, but UCI gave you an even better offer, but UC Berkeley is your number one. So you can actually go to UC Berkeley and say, hey, this is what I got from UCI. Is there anything that you can do 
uh, for my financial aid package um, to make it better. And oftentimes they will come back to the table. It is pretty much very much a negotiating process um, and they might offer you um, some more money. So that's how it kind of works with PhD programs. Unfortunately, master's programs don't work that way. Um, and it's either you get an acceptance, maybe a scholarship. If not, you're gonna have to figure out how else are you gonna be able to kind of pay uh, for graduate school. Um, and then of course, sending thank you emails um, at the very end to everybody who has helped you along the way, whether they're a recommender or a mentor or even a counselor, um, for example. And so other things to kind of keep in mind as you are continuing this process is we encourage you to talk to your faculty, talk to your faculty, existing faculty, maybe faculty that you're having classes with, um, also talking or reaching out to the faculty of the programs that you're interested in. So this is especially very important for PhD students because one of your essays might be, you know, who do you want to do research with? And so you want to make sure that you are knowledgeable and aware of the faculty who are a part of those programs. Um, another thing, if you haven't done this already, um, this is something that you should also do um, as soon as possible, is getting in contact with program representatives um, to get more detailed information about the program, to be able to answer your questions um, about, you know, the courses, financial aid, application process. And so that way they have you already on their radar. Um, and that way, when they actually receive your application, Hopefully that's someone that they can actually remember, like, oh, this person actually reached out to us. Um, this is also really helpful you know, in, in uh, kind of smaller schools as well. Um, another thing that you can also do is reach out to current graduate students in those programs that you are interested in as well. You can also reach out to alumni. Um, I've definitely had my fair share of like students or just individuals reaching out to me on LinkedIn, um, asking to you know, have a chat with me about my own personal um, master's degree experience. And so um, that's not uncommon and something that we definitely encourage you to do. Um, and it's a great way to kind of get, you know, really personal insight information of what they think about their graduate school program and what the courses are like and the faculty and whatnot. Um, and then, of course, uh, you can always reach out to the Division of Career Pathways. You can also reach out to the SARC um, to help you out as well. Um, Alina is actually going to be talking about how you can schedule an appointment with us uh, right now. So um, go ahead, Alina. You can take it away. Thank you so much. OK, so I'm going to send the link in the chat. So that's the SARC website. And on the bottom of the home page, there is a link to um, be able to schedule a appointment. Um, and that takes you to the UCI's appointment system. And once you get to that page, uh, you're able to schedule an appointment with either their graduate student advisors, professional staff, such as Carissa and Patrick, and then the peer consultants. So I'm part of the peer consultant program as, as well as um, like 10 other uh, peer consultants. But um, if you have any questions about graduate school or if you want to have them check your personal statements or essays, um, you can definitely schedule up an appointment with them through our website um, and through the UCI's appointment system. And all you have to do is like enter some basic information about uh, the reason for why you're scheduling and then you get to choose like a date and time but it shouldn't be too uh, hard. Uh, it's a pretty simple process, but okay. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elena. And yeah, as you can see here, we actually have three graduate students that work for the SARC. So these are actually current PhD students within the School of Social Sciences um, that have been through this process before and can certainly help you um, as well. And so they um, have appointments available on Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, so now we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, and I see that maybe we might have a few questions in the chat already. Um, so let's take a look. All right, so our first question is, does applying earlier give me a, an advantage in consideration for acceptance? So yes, I would say depending on the program, it does. Um, and it'll honestly say that on the website, um, please apply as early as possible for full consideration. Um, and uh, I definitely encourage you to um, apply sooner rather than later if possible. Um, sometimes they might have like early decision 
And you should only do that if you are certain that that is the school that you want to go to if they accept you. Okay, but if you have any uncertainty, then I wouldn't go that route um, either. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, next question is, uh, when thinking about uh, doing research during the gap year, where are some places that I can look into? That is a really great question. Um, there is actually a way where you can look up research positions at UCI, for example. So these are like full-time, part-time paid positions to be research assistants. Um, and that's hopefully something that we can um, probably send you in an email as well. Um, but if that's something that you want to apply to at UCI, there's a specific UCI website for that. Um, you can also look into like conducting research at other institutions, um, perhaps at like private companies as well. Um, but it's kind of like a job, you know, essentially you're applying to a research assistant position um, as you would any other uh, job or employer. Okay. And then our next question is, how do I find uh, research opportunities? Also a great question too. Um, so if you're a social science student, um, many of our research opportunities um, are still per being pursued remotely right now. I know for some of the other, um, I guess, departments or other schools, um, especially with like bio and STEM and whatnot, some of their, um, some of their uh, research is considered essential and some of them are doing it on campus. Um, but it's really a matter of reaching out to faculty that you are interested in. Unfortunately, there's not like a one go-to place that where you can find all the research opportunities. Um, that unfortunately doesn't exist, but hopefully at Sark we can maybe change that um, in the near future. Um, but what you'll have to do is actually go to um, the social sciences faculty profile um, list and you can find this actually directly um, by going to just the social sciences website, okay. Um, and perhaps we can actually uh, show you that right now. I don't know. If, um, maybe Alina, do you know where the faculty profiles? Okay, on it. Okay, great. Um, so Alina will actually go ahead and kind of post the link. So it's really just a matter of going to the social science website, looking under faculty and then faculty profiles. And there they will actually put what their research interests are. And so then you can actually reach out to the faculty member. Um, sometimes the faculty will have their own personal websites and that's where they'll include information about their lab. Um, or their research project and how you can get in touch with them. From time to time, we do have faculty that reach out to the SARC and ask us to promote some of their research opportunities. So just make sure that you're reading the SARC newsletter every week um, and um, checking out what opportunities are available to students at that time. Um, and yeah, I think hopefully that answers your question. And you can always actually schedule an appointment with Alina or myself or any other peer consultants, and we can actually go uh, through the graduate school process with you. We also have a uh, graduate school guide um, as well, and perhaps Alina, you can put that in the chat. Um, we definitely encourage you to look through the graduate school that guide that we have to kind of go through that process. Okay, um, let's see, uh, feel free to continue to submit other questions if you have any, but these are all really great questions. And um, another note that I forgot to mention about graduate school is that oftentimes there's quite a few programs that like ask you to just apply later. Okay, so for example, MBA programs, typically have an average of maybe I would say three to five years of professional experience before students actually apply to the program. So uh, I would say those are one of the MBA programs is definitely very common to have a, a gap year um, and something that they often prefer. Not required, but prefer. Um, so yeah, so any other questions, feel free to submit. If not, we'll go ahead and close up today, but you should expect a email from us um, 
kind of providing you additional links and resources. And then hopefully we'll be able to see you at one of our upcoming um, SARC webinars, uh, which actually Alina is gonna be presenting at um, this time. And it's gonna be all about uh, resumes. So if you're thinking about updating your resume for graduate school or updating it for research opportunity um, or a job internship, um, then this is definitely a webinar that's gonna be for you, okay. All right, so I see we have no other questions. So we'll go ahead and end here today. Thank you so much for joining us and um, enjoy the rest of your week. Bye.